guys are worshiping very frisky today. <laughs> awesome. Be seated. Hallelujah. Great to be with you. Um, feels like I haven't been here in such a long time. You know, um, just as we were worshiping, I was just, you know, aware of kind of one of the things the Lord wants for every one of our hearts. And I think right now in this moment, <clears throat> as we start a brand new year, what would be very important for each person here and anyone watching online would be just a restoration of hope. Now, a lot of people are very hopeful for the new year. They're looking forward and saying, you know, hope, what is hope? Hope is the expectation of good things, like, like being convinced that good is waiting for me. It's not the expectation of certain things. It's, it's, the ex, it's a general expectation that good things are ahead for me. And I really don't want to go any further in the service until every last person in this room has that concerning 2020. And I want you to do a heart check because we're going to pray. And I really do mean this. I want this bad for you. I want you to ask yourself this question as we're just in his presence. Are you really expecting good things? Do you, when you think of your future, are you thinking, I know everything's going to turn out right? Maybe not this and maybe not that, I don't, but the things aren't the important part. It's that my life is in God's hands and I'm going to be okay. Because if you don't have that, the Lord absolutely wants to give that to you right this moment because you are his child and he loves you and he, he wants you to trust him. And, and when the human heart doesn't have hope, it's really hard to go anywhere else. It's really hard for anything. You can pray, but it doesn't connect. You can hear the word of God, but it doesn't connect because your heart is just not in a place. Something has come on you that, that suffocates your hope. And that can be broken very easily in an atmosphere like this. And so I do want to pray, and I don't know, maybe this would be a body moment if you would be brave enough. If, if you feel like you just... You're not where you need to be regarding the expectation of the future, and you need a touch from God. I just want you to stand because there are caring believers all over. I want to tell you, I love you, and there are caring believers all the way around you. But you just, your heart is heavy, and when you think about the future, it's just not. There's no spark. There's no. Uh, you've lost that place of hope. I want you to look around, believers, and especially elders and pastors, and I want you to just. Look at your friends, your brothers and sisters. This is the family of God. And I want you just to go stand with them. And I want them to know, I want every person to know that they are not alone. This is so important. Please look around. If you're a caring Christian, I can't have one person standing alone right now. I really, I really, I need every person to have hope. And I want us to pray together. Father, I thank you for your awesome love. Your promise is that you come to give us hope and a future and that you're thinking good thoughts about us, Lord, that you have amazing things ahead for every one of us. And Lord, I know sometimes we get to a place of disappointment where we hoped in some, a thing and it didn't happen or we hoped in a person and they failed us and so we have broken hope. But today, Lord, we make the decision to set our hope on you, that you are our Father, that you are watching out for us, that you are here for us. And Lord, I break the hopelessness in the name of Jesus that has iced over certain people's hearts and minds, and I break it right now in the name of Jesus. And I pray the fire of your love that's in this room would melt that icy hopelessness and it would dissolve and it would break and it would fall off of every heart. And Lord, I'm asking for people to be able to recover their heart, recover the hope that they had, Lord, at one time, not in a person or a thing, but their hope will be in you, Lord, that you love them and that you are going to bless them. Father, I invoke the power of the Holy Spirit right now upon every person. And I ask, Lord, that the miracle of this day would be that every person in this room walks away 
with hope, the hope of Jesus Christ, the hope for their future that you intend for them to have. We pour in the oil and the wine right now to every person. We pour in the oil and the wine right now. Come on, I want every believer praying right now. We're gonna melt off some icy hopelessness right now with our prayers. Father, right now we loose the mighty Spirit of God, the, fi- the warm, glowing fire of the Holy Spirit to break off hopelessness in every life. For every person watching online, I thank you for your supernatural power. We agree for this, Lord. And we're gonna take a minute and thank you and receive it and actually love each other into new hope. We praise you for it. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Now, I don't usually command hugs, but I think there needs to be some hugs in this room. I think even if you don't know somebody, you could just get a hug and that would be a part of the the prescription. If you don't have somebody to hug, just come up and hug me or, or hug somebody on your row, hug somebody that didn't stand. There just needs to be some love in this room. <laughs> and uh, the grace of God is on you. Hallelujah. Praise God. You can be seated. Pastor Chip, would you join me up here? Our faithful executive pastor over operations. How many love this man? He has a, a big job, uh, a big job to do, and part of part of what Pastor Chip does is, you know, making sure we're safe and making sure the building is good, and uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of the administration and operations and all that. And he's been with me 21 years almost, and uh, I appreciate him. And uh, but I'm honoring him. But I but I, I we're going to honor somebody else today that's not standing up here, and uh, I want to I want to ask the women and the men. If you've been enjoying the restrooms lately, I don't mean. Does that does that sound like a too personal of a question? Is that too personal? <laughs> I, do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean by that? Don't they look awesome? Well, that didn't just happen. It was done, and it was done in an unusual way. And I want Pastor Chip to describe the story a little bit. John, would you? Come up here, please. John Etheridge? If you don't know John Etheridge, he's a board member, he's an elder, he's a man of God, he is a servant like you can't believe. And How many years have you been in the church, John? Uh, over 40. Over 40, that's all. Wow, that's all. John is, and John's his wife, Benita. Yeah, Benita. Benita, stand up. Yeah. John is... He gives above and beyond. One of our values at Gateway is generosity. This mm. is a, an amazing example yeah. of generosity in finance, but more in gifts and skills and abilities. Those restrooms are, they're a team effort, but that team was led by John. He put in literally hundreds of hours above his regular job here, mornings, late, early, late afternoons, evenings, planning, weekends, to get those just the way they are. Saved Gateway literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. Man. Our first bi- Man. And Woo! we just appreciate John so much. <laughs> Want you to get a chance to say thank you to him. It was, it's an incredible, we're going to start, he's going to start over again on the next set. Oh my goodness. Uh, in the next few weeks. Here we go again. Um, so we're going to ride this horse a little farther. But John, thank you so much. <laughs> we have a gift for you and for Vanita. We'd love you to get away, go to Monterey, Santa Cruz, the coast. Wherever you want to go, spend a few nights, a enjoy honey. it all on us. Have a little Thank honey you so more. much. John, I love you. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, John. I don't know how the Lord keeps track of those things, but uh, I, I would take a guess that that has to be one of the greatest volunteer contributions in the history of our church because that was a $400,000 job that was done for just, I don't know, uh, a little over $100,000. And he was on it for months and months and months. He said, well, what's taking so long? Well, the guy was doing it in his spare time. And, uh, and it looks great. So we appreciate all the volunteers. We, uh, we had quite a weekend 
with the prayer surge. We had a 24-hour, a 24-hour prayer surge here, and um, there were hundreds of people live uh, that came through during that 24 hours, which was incredible. And then, in so many of our families, we had corresponding. Uh, so many of our families, so many of our campuses, we had corresponding. Uh, yeah, their family. Corresponding prayer meetings with dozens and scores of people in each of those cities. And I was looking at the numbers of people even that just joined online uh, that, that, that were a part of it. Unique visitors, 980-something people that were a part. So I think, I mean, I don't think it's a stretch to say that, it, that at a minimum, a 1,000 people, that would be a low, low number. But let's just say some of those 983 visitors were just somebody looking and wondering what was going on. But hundreds and hundreds of people were engaged in prayer, in 24-hour prayer. And uh, I, I think that's amazing. I think you are amazing. I think the Lord is amazing. And I'm so grateful for that. So let's get our expectation up for the, for the new year. I'm going to share a message about prayer. Surprise. Prayer is not a part of a cool thing that we're doing. Prayer is not a, an accessory. For us, as a church, prayer is foundational. It's, it's the foundation of everything. And I would say to you, as you are building your life and your marriage and your family, I think prayer is the right foundation for you. I think prayer is the only foundation because you say, well, it should be Jesus, and I agree. But if you're not talking to Jesus, that's not much of a foundation. So engaging with Jesus and living life in prayer um, together, to me, is a supernatural key to every door that God has for us uh, in the future. Whatever your dream is, whatever your hope is, whatever you want for America, whatever you want for your children, whatever you want for your church, prayer is the key that opens the door. Everybody wants to go through the door, but we need the keys. And so that's why we're focusing on prayer. And today, I want to, we're going to do a couple of messages on, over the next few weeks, called Circles of Prayer. And I think you'll understand that better in just a few moments. But our, our preaching team has been taking a look at a story that's inspired that phrase, Circles of Prayer. And uh, it's, it's recounted by an author named Mark Batterson, but it really comes from Jewish tradition. It's a story that would not be equal to Scripture, but it sure is an interesting story. And it's the story of Honi, and it tells a truth for us, and the truth would be something like this. Bold prayer honors God, and God honors bold prayer. Bold prayer honors God, and God honors bold prayer. It was the first century BC, and a devastating drought had threatened to destroy the generation of people who were alive just before the Lord Jesus was born. This was the Jewish people. All of the Jewish prophets had died. I talked to you about the silent period of time just before Christ was born, and this was that time. So the memory in people's minds of the Lord speaking was distant. The Lord hadn't spoken in a long, long time. Except there was one man who lived outside the city walls of Jerusalem. And he believed that God had spoken to him. And he believed that God was alive. And he believed in the power of prayer. His name was Honi. And even if the people could no longer hear God, he believed he could still hear him. During this drought, of course, rain was the most important thing that you could ever want or need, especially in an ancient uh, civilization where there's not piping and plumbing and irrigation. Rain is essential. So the legend says that Honey prayed for rain during this drought, but he did it in an unusual way. He took a six-foot staff in his hand, and uh, Honey put it on the ground, and he spun around like a math compass, and he drew a circle on the ground. He said, well, that sounds like witchcraft. Not exactly, because what Honey did is he got inside that circular mark on the ground, and then he stood and dropped to his knees and raised his hands to heaven and began to pray for rain. And he said, 
God, we need rain, and I swear before you that I will not leave this circle until we have rain. That must have been an unusual thing for people to hear. That wasn't just the volume of his voice. I think there must have been an authority in his voice, and it flowed from his soul, and it wasn't, he wasn't pressuring God, but he certainly meant business. And one of the things I've learned about God is if you mean business with God, God means business with you. And let's get that right with our prayer and with our leadership and with our righteous living for him and with anything and everything that we do. If you really mean it, God will meet you there. But if you're just casually interested, he may not be attracted to that. And sure enough, as he prayed, within a short period of time, a few little raindrops came. Now, if it had been me, I would say mission accomplished. (laughs) It's raining. But he said, God, it wasn't for this kind of rain that I prayed. I pray for rain that is equal to your mercy. I pray for rain that comes from your heart and takes care of this drought that we've been in. And you can imagine what happens. Soon, the, the skies were thundering. They said that the, uh, wa- the legend says that the raindrops were as big as eggs. Now, I don't know. But the point is that the rain was, a, that was such an outpouring of, of rain that it actually flattened, uh, threatened flash floods. People started climbing up on top of their homes and heading for... Tony's still in a circle. Now the rain is coming so fast and so hard that it's going to wipe everybody out. And he said, God, I, I, what I mean is, <laughs> rain that will be like your mercy that will come down and bless us and not destroy us. And the rain pulled back, and it was a gentle, steady rain that broke the drought and convinced every person about the power of bold prayer. Now, I don't know if that story is true, but the principle is true. And the principle is that if we will draw a circle, I don't mean a literal circle, but if we will get to a place where we say, God, I'm not going to let go of this issue. I just read the other day where Jacob said pretty much the same thing to, to God and to the angel of the Lord as he wrestled. He said, I won't let you go until you bless me. And it takes heart and it takes faith to pray in that way. But I believe if we mean business with God, he will mean business with us. And whether the story is true, it was deemed one of the most significant prayers in the history of Israel. And it became a testament to the power of tenacious prayer. So I want to spend a few minutes just talking about the idea that that God honors bold prayer and bold prayer honors the Lord. Small prayers do not appeal to God. Small prayers do not glorify God. They don't test his greatness. They don't test his love for us. They don't really call him. Our God is the God of Red Sea partings. And we need to be people of big prayers, big faith, and, uh, and, and, and bold prayers. There is nothing that God loves more than keeping promises and answering prayers and performing miracles and fulfilling dreams. To pray like this, you have to believe a few things. The first thing you have to believe is you have to believe that God is for you. Prayer is not getting a reluctant God to finally agree to do what you really need him to do, what you'd really like him to do. Although we, a lot of times we look at prayer that way. Prayer is actually engaging a loving God who wants to meet our needs and will meet them through the vehicle of prayer. It is engaging him in the system that he designed. He delights when we pray because he said, this is exactly what I want my people to do and I'm gonna train them by blessing them and answering their prayer. God likes us to pray. Now, I don't, I don't know why, but he likes it. And so the bolder the prayer, the bigger the dream, I think the more he likes it. David said, in my distress, 
I panicked. Is that what he said? (laughs) In my distress, I held back my tithe. In my distress, I screamed at my wife. In my distress, you don't understand, God. So I just separated from God because I was stressed out. I stopped praying. In my distress, I pulled back and didn't pray because, you know, God, what's going on? No, David said, in my distress was the moment that I prayed. And the Lord did what? He answered me and set me free. The lesson is, the Lord is for me. So I will have no fear. What can people do to me? The Lord is for me. And he will help me. you got to believe that God is for you. He said, but you don't know my mistakes. God, God knows your mistakes. He's still for you. He still wants to help you. He still wants to, but you don't know my weaknesses. He's still for you. He is for you. And if you're in distress, you call on him and he helps you. If you don't believe that, then you will pray small prayers, timid prayers, wimpy prayers, insincere prayers, halfway prayers. But if you believe God is for you, you get a little bolder in your faith and you go to another level. I've struggled with that you know, feeling that uh, maybe you have it. I know, God, you're for me, but I don't, I don't feel like I deserve this or I don't deserve that. Or I, I'm like embarrassed to pray because you think, I don't know, would God want that for me? I don't know. But I've seen time and time again where I prayed for this and God gave me this. And it has an effect on me. It shocks me. And I say, why would you do that? One answer could be that he loves me more than he loves other people. (laughs) But that isn't the right answer. Because the Bible says that he's no respecter of persons. So if you don't love me more, and I, and, I know, and I know the answer isn't that I'm more obedient than other people. I know that isn't the answer. The, the answer is he's just good. He, he just likes to do great things for people that honor him and love him. And, and sometimes for people that don't. He's just a good God. We... <clears throat> We decided uh, about a year ago, about a year ago, we put our house that we've been in uh, for 16 years uh, on the market and wanted a different style of house. We weren't, truly, we were not looking for a better house. We were just looking for a different floor plan. We like our neighborhood. We like the way we were living. We had no complaints. We just wanted a different kind of layout. And, um, <clears throat> and so we we found a house that was approximately what we wanted. And it was on a really cool street. We loved the street. And so we became stalkers. <laughs> we started driving down that street. And uh, we weren't ready to buy yet. The house was for sale. And we were saying, Lord, don't let anybody else get this house. This is the one we want. And then finally, the, the time came where we had concluded the business with the sale of our first house. And... Uh, we tried to make an offer on that house that we wanted, on that street that we wanted, that where we had prayed, Lord, we want this house. Have you ever done crazy stuff? Like, I stood on the driveway. And I just muttered a few prayers. Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name that this house is my house. We, <laughs> we sowed a gift um, we gave. I, I believe in blending your prayer with giving. You can't buy a blessing, but there's something about sowing a seed. So we had an amount. We, it was a sacrificial amount. We gave it to the Lord, and we just said, it's done. Well, when, we, um, when it was time for us to, to make the offer on the house, they pulled the house off the market. The house isn't for sale. I said, I want to buy it anyway. Let's make an offer anyway. I told Gabe, he's our, let's make an offer anyway. So we wrote up an offer, and they ignored it, which was totally rude. <laughs> house is not for sale. And I, I, I love that street, and I love that house, and I thought, huh? all right, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm trusting you, really. This ain't my first rodeo. I know you've got a house for us. It wasn't the one I wanted. 
And I don't know, six or eight weeks later, we kept looking at other houses, and it just some were too expensive, some were too crazy. So none of them really were right, and they weren't where I wanted to be. I wanted to be on that street. <laughs> and sure as shooting, six weeks later, a house that was bigger and more expensive, out of our price range, actually. We weren't looking in that price range. It was bigger, better, nice backyard. Comes on the market, guess where? On that street. I didn't, I thought, you know, that's, that's too high. I'm not going to get that house. That's, that's, that's not where I'm looking. And long story short, guess what happened? We got the house. We got it for the price that we wanted. And God made a miracle. And, I, and it was completely, uh, completely hard to handle for me. I couldn't process. I said, God, I was going for a smaller house. I didn't want a house like this. I, I wasn't even dreaming, but you did it. And it's on the street of all the streets. That house wasn't for sale before, but now it was for sale. The guy got a job transfer. I'm going to thank him one day for accepting the job so I could have his house. And they needed to sell. What am I saying? I'm way off my notes, in case you haven't noticed. But, but what I'm saying is that there... There is, God is just so good that at times he will do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. And our only takeaway from that can be that he's good. And so you've got to say, God, you're for me. And if I ask you for souls to be saved, if I ask you for revival, if I ask you for uh, my son or my daughter to be saved, you certainly will hear this prayer. You can't give up with a God that good. You have to be bold. You have to, you have to press in. And one of the great stories of pressing in is Jericho. Let's go quickly. I want to read the story of Jericho. Many of you know this story, but let's read it. And I'll make a few comments, and then we'll pray to a great big God. But I'm going to challenge you about circles of prayer. I'm going to challenge you to make your stand and say, this is really what I want. And then trust God with the outcome. Joshua 6, 1 through 16. The gates of Jericho were securely barred. This is a walled city. By the way, it's an ancient city. This is one of the, I've been there a number of times. It's, uh, uh, you guys were with me. And uh, um, 10,000 years old. One of, the, one, of the, one of the most important archaeological sites. But this is a walled city. And it says, no one went out and no one came in. The Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. Along with the king, and I've given this to you. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Draw a circle. That's what he's saying. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark, and on the seventh day, march around the city seventh time, seven times on the seventh day, and have the priests blowing the trumpet. When you hear them sound the long blast of the trumpet, have the whole army give a shout. Does God like shouting? Then the wall of the city will collapse, and the army will go up, and everyone straight in. It'll be yours. So Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and have the, high, have the seven priests carry the trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army advance. March around the city with the armed guards going ahead of the ark of the Lord. And when he had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the ark of the Lord of the covenant followed them. This was about presence, taking the presence taking the living presence with you. And that ark was a, a piece of furniture, like a chest, but the lid was called the mercy seat. And you get into it through mercy, which is amazing. The armed guard marched ahead of the priest who blew the trumpet, and the rear guard followed the ark, and all this time the trumpets were sounding. But Joshua commanded the army, do, do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until I tell you to shout. Then shout. So the ark of the Lord carried, uh, they carried the ark of the Lord around the city, doing what? Circling it. Then the army returned to camp and spent the night there, and Joshua 
got up early the next morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord, and the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord, and blowing the trumpets, and the armed men went ahead of them, and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. On the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days, and on the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled it seven times. The seventh time around, the priest sounded the trumpet blast, just as God had said. Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now, we all know how the story ends. The walls came down, and they had a great victory. But the thing I want us to to think about here is that God said before they had made the first circle, it's yours, it's yours. But then there was human responsibility. We have a part to play. Even when God says this healing is yours, this provision is yours, this breakthrough is yours, I've given it to you, but you have a part in it and obedience. And for me, one of the things that God enjoys and understands that what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to land in our church right here is prayer is the march that God enjoys. Prayer is the thing that he says to us, I want you to do this, and if you do it, what's yours is really going to be yours. It's not yours because I've given it to you. It's actually going to be in your hand, in your pocket, in your life. So obedience and prayer take us from it's mine to I actually have it. That's why I want you to pray bold prayers, and I don't ever want you to give up in prayer. Now, let me make a few comments about this story. What a great story, right? A few things here just to, just to point out. Number one, if you want the walls to come down, if you want to draw a circle of prayer, if you want to learn this, the first thing you've got to do is identify your Jericho. That's number one. You've got to know what you're praying for. Write this down. Most of us don't get what we want because we don't know what we want. We haven't bought into, I really need this, I really want this, I really... Now, I'm not talking about things, because you can pray for things, and that's fine. I prayed for a house, and God is good. But there's much more important things to pray for than houses, aren't there? You might know what kind of a car you want. You might know what kind of a house you want. You might know what kind of a job you want. Do you know what kind of a life you want? Do you know what kind of a miracle you want? Do you know what kind of a ministry you want? Do you know what you want God to do for your nation? Do you, do you know the, the, the habit that you've been in that really needs to be broken because it's wrong? Do you know what you want? And, and that's a principle in prayer. You've got to know what you want. It was in the same city, Jericho, just a, a few thousand years later when Jesus was walking down the streets of that same city and a couple of blind men cried out to him. And he asked them a crazy question. What do you want? Because you've got to know what you want. Now, if you're blind, it should be fairly obvious what you want. But God was, Jesus wasn't being insensitive to them. He wasn't being clueless. He was saying, ask me to help you. Ask me for specifically what you want and need. Because when you ask specifically, you empower the system that God has set up. And he says, I thought you'd never ask. Well, God, you know my heart. Mm-hmm. But there's something, uh, there's, there's a lesson in prayer. Well, God knows what I want. I don't have to ask. No, he does know what you want, but he's just waiting for you to say, I, re- I really want this. I want to see. I can't see. And he healed them. And they followed him because you don't run away from that kind of love. You you stay with it. You say, I want more. And so you've got to identify your Jericho. Number two, you've got to stand on the promise of God. Now, 
we could pray about a lot of things, but when we're praying about something that God has promised, wow. That's powerful. I love this verse in 2 Samuel where David, who was so close to God, but this is the way he prayed. He said, now, Lord God, keep the promise that you made to me. Do as you promised. You, Lord of the armies, God of Israel, have revealed it to me, saying, I will build a house for you. That is why I have found the courage, the boldness, the permission to offer this prayer to you. I'm not making this up, God. I'm asking for what you promised. You said, my whole, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, and your whole household. You said that, God. I didn't say that. So, so God, I'm crying out to you because my son is backslidden. And I'm asking you, God, to keep your promise, and I know that you will. Amen. And that's a bold thing. And when you pray, look, faith, write this down, faith turns a promise into a prayer. When you have a promise, turn it into a prayer. A scripture, a, a verse, a a prophetic word, a, a deep down inside belief that it's God's will. We know it's God's will. Now, Lord, keep the promise that you've made and turn that verse into a prayer. Pray the word of God. It's powerful. Pray the promises of God. Pray the, what do you think the book of Psalms is? It's a book of prayers. Don't just read it. Pray it. Find one you like. And stand on it and pray it out to God. What are you praying for? I'm praying the promise of Isaiah 58. I'm praying the promise of, 23, of Psalm 24, 6. I'm praying the promise of Psalm 18. I'm praying Psalm 116. I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. I'm standing on that promise. And as you stand on that promise, you say, Lord, keep this promise. Are you getting anything out of this? Don't just read the Bible. Circle the promise and pray the promise. Number three, you've got to follow God's directions. I think Jericho is a beautiful story about following God's directions. Could I ask you, are you following God's directions? What he's told you, how he's, how he's told you to do it? Well, I want him to bless me, but I, I don't pray, and I don't give, and I don't believe. Well, what you're really doing is you're asking God to violate his own word. You're asking God to do something for you when you aren't doing anything for him. So obedience becomes this. It's like a relationship. I'm not talking about training your dog obedience. That's not what God wants. He wants cooperation. He wants, he wants, he says, here's the way I'd like to do it. I would like you to participate in the way that I do things. Do this. And if you do this, I'll do this. And we say, no, I don't think so. I don't know how to help you. If that's your attitude, I don't think I can help you. If you don't want to participate in God's plan with obedience, and, and we all fight against ourselves, and we, we all do things we know we're not supposed to do. I'm not saying that. And God, God is very gracious, and he's very loving. But at the end of the day, it really does matter if we do it his way or not. He's not asking for perfection. He just wants us to cooperate and obey and do it do it his way, the way he's got it wired. Do it God's way. I have news for you. If you're thinking that you can get the God of heaven to do it your way, you're in for a long wait. And God has lots of time. He's not bothered. He does, he's not. His ways are higher than your ways. So if somebody's going to change their ways, it's going to be you and me, not him. Because his ways are perfect. He's perfect in all of his ways. So follow God's directions. John 15, 5 through 7, Jesus said it best. When you live separated from me, you're powerless. But if you, have, if you live in life union with me, and if my words live powerfully within you, you can ask whatever you desire, and it will be done. I love the story of David Cho, Yonggi Cho, the pastor of the largest church in Korea. 
what's the secret of your success? He said two things. I pray and I obey. Everybody say, I pray, I pray. and I obey. I obey. The Lord will bless you. He's no, resp- he's no, and it's funny because, uh, you know, God's ways don't always make a lot of sense. Circling a city one time each day and then seven times on the seventh day is not exactly a conventional, logical approach. You may not think God's recipes are brilliant. You may have an issue with something that God wants. Well, I don't like that. Again, I don't know how to help you. God has his ways, and they don't, they're not logical to our way of thinking, but it is his way. And if you do it his way, you're going to get his result. Okay, God sees our obedience, not just our needs. He's looking at our at our life of obedience and our response to him, not just what we need. He's willing to sit with you having a need for a long time. But when you use, it's like unlocking a safe. If you don't want to use the combination, I don't know how to help you. There's a combination. Well, change it to the one that I want. It's too late. It's already set. This is the combination. If you want to open the safe, you follow the combination. And then... Everything is easy. Okay. Hi, Jim. How you doing? Oh, am I supposed to stop talking at some point? Okay, thank you. No, I, it's time to stop. But I got to give you one more thing. The, the last one is bold. Boldly persist. Don't give up. Pastor Chip's going to share a great message next Sunday on persistence from Luke, from Luke 18. Jesus told his disciples a story about how they should never give up in prayer. And that's something important for all of us. We need to discover the difference between praying for and praying through. Everybody say praying for. We all know what that is. Have you ever prayed through? Prayed through until you got it? Well, I just feel if I pray for it, God knows. Pray through. I think part of why I get interested in things like the prayer surge, bold things, persistent things, unusual things, relentless things, is because I've discovered the power of never giving up in prayer. It's like a guy that's fishing in the ocean, and he feels the tug on his line. He's got 100 yards of line in the water, and he feels that tug, and he starts cranking, and he draws in... 10 yards of string and his arm is tired. 20 yards, his arm is more tired. 30 yards, I can't go on. It's yours, it's on the line. You got it. But don't give up until your fish is in the boat. And prayer is like that. Prayer is the the cranking of of the reel until the fish is in the boat. And for all our talk about faith and instant miracles and all that, to be honest with you, most of my life has not been miracles. Most of the great things in my life have been processes of staying on things and a lot of cranking and a lot of reeling and a lot of praying and a lot of waiting and a lot of patience. And that's just the way it is. But you can't tell a fisherman, I just can't believe it takes so long to get a fish in the boat. They'll say, well, then get, don't fish. This is how it works. If you want to eat that tuna, you got to keep cranking that reel until that tuna is in the boat. Here's, here's what I'm saying to us. It's time to start drawing some circles. It's time to say, Lord, I need rain. And here's how I'm going to pray. I'm not going anywhere until you keep the promise that you've made to me because I know you're good. I know you're good and I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to stop knowing how good you are. You give rain. You do it all the time. We need it now. Would you bow your heads? Father, I thank you for this gift of prayer. You invented it. You created it. It's 
It's the way it works. It's the combination. It's the real. It's the secret. And I'm asking, Lord, for all the needs that are ahead for us, Lord, that you would not only hear our cry, but teach us to pray. Teach us to persist and really never give up. Even with things like eternity, we need to be sure, we need to know for sure that we're saved. And while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I just want to ask this simple question. Do you know for sure that your sins are forgiven? How could you know? Well, the Bible makes us a promise. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say whoever calls on the name of the Lord and cleans up their act. God does want you to clean up your act, but whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you called on the Lord? Because that's prayer. The most important prayer you can ever pray is, Lord, save me. Save me. Forgive me of my sins. Change my life. And while we're just here in this moment of closing the service out, heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'd just like to know if there's anybody and anybody watching online, I always want to give people a chance to call on the name of the Lord and say, Lord, I need to be saved. I need your love. If that's you, I just want to pray for you. And I think that prayer would make a big difference in your life. If that's you and you'd like my prayers, I would never embarrass you, but would you just lift your hand and say, that's me, I need... I want to know that I, yeah, I see your hand. I see your hand. I just want to know for sure that I'm right with God. I want to help you to call on the Lord. I see your hand, sir. Thank you. I see your hand. That's wonderful. There's men giving their hearts to the Lord today, which is, makes sense to me. Hallelujah. You can put your hands down. I'm going to pray for you. Father, we all together as a church, we pray for these ones that are calling out to you. Hear their prayer, Lord. Change their life. Wash away their sins and give them the power of the Holy Spirit to live for you. We know how good you are. You are a sin forgiver. Thank you, Lord. We ask you to do this in Jesus' name. There's a prayer we're going to put up on the screen. I want to ask everybody to pray this prayer. Those of you that raised your hands and those that didn't, because it's just an example of how to pray. And I believe if you believe these words, God will receive it. And this will be the way we draw a circle right now. Let's all pray. If you raised your hand or if you didn't, let's all pray. Father God, thank you for the power of your promises. Today, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins and fill me with the truth that you are for me. I repent of trying to live life without your love and power in my life. Teach me to seek you and trust you as never before, especially in prayer. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And just like that, you've drawn a circle. Now just believe that it's yours. Just believe that forgiveness is yours, eternal life is yours, and that whatever he has promised to you, he will give it to you. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, We'd love to connect with you in a special way. There's a, there's a counter outside in the lobby that says, welcome. And your next step would be to fill out the card that's in front of you that says, uh, those of you that prayed, it's a card that says, I've decided. Fill that out completely. We have a gift we want to give you. We want to get you started with a Bible and a few simple materials to point you in the right direction. There's more for you to learn, and we want to help you to get there so you can have everything that God has for you. I'd love to meet you. If I haven't met you, I'd love to shake your hand after the service and um, help you get on your pathway of following Jesus because you don't walk away from that kind of love. You just stay with it. You just follow it. So we're, we're doing that together. We're following that kind of love as believers. We're going to receive the tithe and offering now. The usher's going to serve you. The team's going to lead you in some worship. And in just a moment, I'll be back. Thank you for your word. You received that, God. Thank you, Jesus. There's nothing stronger. There's nothing There's nobody on the road. There's nothing greater than the name of Jesus. All the honor. All the honor. All the power. All the
let's do a Jericho shout. Come on, let's do a Jericho shout this morning. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Let every wall come down, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. I noticed a few of you putting uh, prayer requests up on the, on the board, which is awesome. So we better pray for those. But the boards are coming down. So we'll pray one last time for every need because we, we do care about everybody's need. And if you need special prayer, that's what our teams are here for. We're always here to pray with you and help you with your prayer needs. And uh, it's been a wonderful, uh, wonderful weekend just praying for hundreds of hundreds of people and, and needs and so on. So would you stretch your hands toward the boards and let's just believe one last time. Let's draw our circle. Lord, we're believing, not for many of these. We're believing for every single one of them, Lord. And we won't stop praying, Lord, until the fish is in the boat. But we thank you that you're a good God. And now, Lord, would you meet the needs of your people and let the blessing of a fresh anointing of prayer come upon every one of us, Lord. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.